Good afternoon, my name is May, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Take Brain Health to Heart to Heart conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you, and Ms. Molly French, you may begin your conference. Thank you so much, May, and hi, everyone. I'm um, Molly French, Director of Public Health here at the Alzheimer's Association, and, and really want to welcome you to our National Public Health Week webinar, Take Brain Health to Heart, Evidence, and Public Health Action. I am joined here by my uh, public health colleague at the association, John Sheehan. And I'll introduce our wonderful presenters in, in a minute. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, you'll see a poll on the side of your screen asking, asking you to tell us about your field. Uh, please go ahead and take a minute to or go ahead and respond to that. Over the next hour, you're going to hear what experts consider to be risk factors that may be able to reduce risk for cognitive decline. Uh, learn about how two states have approached uh, applied this evidence to educate adults about brain health. And then we'll talk uh, quickly and then provide you after the webinar uh, with some ideas and suggestions for free resources uh, that public health professionals and their partners can use to, again, educate the public about uh, brain health. So again, uh, please respond to the poll on the side of your screen. We are recording the webinar today, so it's available to others. Uh, next week, late next week, we'll send a recording of the webinar along with a PDF of the slides out to everyone. Uh, we do want to, before we close the poll, we do want to acknowledge the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for the support that enables us to offer this webinar. But of course, the opinions expressed during the webinar are solely those of the individual presenters. And if we could close the poll. And I see uh, we have quite a few people. Um, both from the Alzheimer's and other dementia community, but we have a good number of public health professionals, so welcome during National Public Health Week. Uh, and then a number of folks from both healthcare and the aging and disability group. Uh, and so we'll hear about the evidence for risk reduction. Uh, there will be a question and comment period. Uh, please use your chat function to participate in that or ask any other questions, and then we'll dive into two wonderful models of state public health department action, and then we'll have a full discussion with phone and chat in the final segment. We're honored today to have uh, four wonderful speakers, and I'm going to just do their introductions all at once so that um, so that we can proceed with the, the meat of the webinar. So we'll first welcome Dr. Schneider. He is a professor of psychiatry, neurology, and gerontology at the Keck School of Medicine and the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California. Uh, Dr. Schneider directs the USC California Alzheimer's Disease Center, the clinical core of the USC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and the Geriatric Studies Center. He has substantial experience, expertise and deep experience in clinical trials, methods, uh, and drug development. He served on the Lancet Commission. He provides editorial leadership for prominent scientific journals and certainly is a well-respected uh, um, well and acknowledged expert. He holds a master's degree in biometry and epidemiology. Presenting uh, on behalf of Michelle James, the Director of Division of Healthy Aging at the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control, uh, Ms. James was unable to join us today. Uh, but we do have Beth Solkowski. Uh, Ms. Solkowski is the Vice President of Communications and Advocacy for the Alzheimer's Association South Carolina chapter, where she oversees 
state and federal public policy activities, works with grassroots advocates, and coordinates with state agency partners. Over the last couple of years, uh, Ms. Wilkowski has partnered with Ms. James in the development and implementation of the Health Department's Brain Health Campaign. And Ms. Wilkowski has been with the Alzheimer's Association for 11 years. We're also very pleased to welcome Rachel Wexler. She's a health, the Health Promotion Coordinator in the Public Health Division of the New Mexico Department of Health. She has more than 15 years of experience working to improve both individual and population health in New Mexico. Her leadership in public health is strongly influenced by her background in physical education, recreation, healthy aging is a primary focus of her work. And co-presenting with Ms. Wexler is Gary Huron. He is Executive Director of the Alzheimer's Association New Mexico Chapter with more than 25 years of executive and administrative experience in the areas of healthcare, operational management, and financial management in both the nonprofit and governmental sectors. His education includes an MBA, Master of Divinity, and he's a licensed clin uh, professional clinical counselor in New Mexico. So research suggests that the changes, the brain, changes in the brain associated with Alzheimer's actually may begin 20 or more years before the symptoms appear. And of course, this is very similar to um, the development of other chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, where you have the antecedents of the disease um, starting before you see the symptoms. This 20 plus, perhaps plus year window um, provides us with a lot in the public health community with a lot of uh, opportunity to intervene, to change, uh, to alter uh, the progression and outcomes. As you'll hear today, there are multiple opportunities to reduce risk at a population level for cognitive decline and possibly also dementia. So you may wonder, what do I mean when I say cognitive decline? And that refers to the deterioration in memory or, or cognition that is to some extent expected with age. But normal cognitive decline is different from dementia in that it's not severe enough to interfere with daily life. Um, just a quick overview of the Alzheimer's Association. We've been working on uh, reducing risk for cognitive decline uh, and to extend that that extends to dementia uh, for quite a while. Uh, our board of directors incorporated uh, risk reduction as a, a central tenet of our mission statement. In 2005, we started the Healthy Brain Initiative and with a strong and tight partnership with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Another highlight is uh, evidence review uh, on modifiable risk factors that we did with the World Dementia Council. Uh, we have begun a variety of programs and communications initiatives to help educate the public about brain health. And uh, a little bit later, I'll be telling you about um, some research that we're funding. We're really excited about uh, to focus on lifestyle interventions and risk reduction. Uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, we have a series of roadmaps to support the Healthy Brain Initiative. The roadmaps provide uh, pragmatic, feasible actions that the public health community can take with partners uh, to regarding cognitive health and caregiving. These actions align with four domains in the essential services of public health. And of course, uh, we're focused today on one particular action, which calls upon public health to use evidence-based messaging about risk reduction to promote cognitive health. Uh, 
a quick overview, you know, of, in 2015, uh, there were two reports that came out uh, to really start bringing together and discussing, uh, looking at the evidence base overall in terms of risk factors for dementia. One was the Institute of Medicine's uh, 2015 report on cognitive aging, and the other was the evidence review by the Alzheimer's Association for the World Dementia Council that was also published in 2015. These uh, reports reached nearly identical conclusions. Both found a growing evidence base to support public health action uh, in terms of cognitive decline. The Alzheimer's Association experts uh, found uh, that there is a potential that the evidence points to the potential to reduce risk at a population level for cognitive decline, uh, particularly through regular physical activity, management of cardiovascular risk factors, uh, which includes both, uh, which includes midlife high blood pressure, uh, controlled diabetes, uh, reducing obesity during midlife, and uh, quitting smoking. Uh, Certainly, uh, eating a healthy Mediterranean diet, engaging in cognitively challenging activities may uh, also help protect against cognitive decline, and our review also pointed to uh, solid evidence regarding two risk factors, uh, which are years of formal education and moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. Certainly, the National Academies of Medicine, um, and other groups have reviewed the evidence base, uh, but of course using different questions and methods. And so anytime you uh, ask a different question in science, sometimes you get little different answers. Um, and so we we're really delighted uh, to be featured today and focus on the most recent evidence review uh, by the Lancet International Commission. And I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Schneider to provide an overview of this important report. Okay, thank you, Molly. It's uh, my my privilege actually to represent the Lancet uh, uh, the Lancet Commission on on dementia prevention, uh, uh, treatment, and care. Next slide. And next, what I'll be doing in what I'll be doing in uh, hopefully just uh, just 10 minutes uh, is provide an overview of the uh, commission's findings, but uh, uh, not before telling you a bit about the commission and um, and its methods, and uh, then discussing prevalence modifiable risk factors and the burdens of uh, the burdens and care for people with dementia, and obviously the public health implications for prevention and early treatment. Next. So the Lancet Commission was set up for the obvious reasons that, uh, um, that, that Molly described, the markedly increasing number of, uh, uh, of people uh, will develop dementia over the next 50 years or so. In part, that's due to increased longevity. Uh, uh, costs, obviously, will rise. Uh, the commission was formed with 24 international experts uh, on dementia. It was chaired by, uh, by Jill Livingston, who's the director of the dementia program at the University of College uh, London. Uh, there were five uh, Americans uh, represented uh, on the commission. Uh, next slide. So prevalence and modifiable risk factors. Next. So we're faced with several interesting demographic facts. One is increasing longevity. And you're looking at a, at, a, uh, at a figure showing the increased longevity amongst many countries in the world over the last 100 years. Animation, next. Next. And back. I think the animation is not going to work. So just, uh, and unfortunately, I apologize that I'm not collecting, I'm not uh, controlling the slides. What you see in the blue circle is the difference in longevity between uh, African Americans and, you can't quite see it, um, Americans overall 
And uh, what, what you see, even though it's subtle, is an increase in longevity in both groups. Next. And what this is demonstrating, yet and perhaps somewhat paradoxically, is the decreasing incidence and prevalence as measured by percent in dementia. So even though we're having an increased absolute number of, uh, uh, of people developing dementia, they're developing later, we're developing dementia later in life, and these figures show the decreased risk, uh, the de decreased uh, uh, risk and incidence ratio, rate ratio from decade to decade in several epidemiologic cohorts. Next. This is about a decrease, a, uh, an incidence rate ratio of 0.4 to 0.8 versus the previous decade. If we had this effect, if we were able to achieve this effect with a drug, we would be uh, talking about a cure. Next. So this is demonstrating age-specific incidence in, um, uh, of, uh, and prevalence of dementia. And the point here is that Alzheimer disease diagnoses, dementia diagnoses, are pretty uncommon before the age of 70. And even during the decade of the 70s, the increase incidence, uh, the increase in incidence is, um, is starting to pick up, but uh, rather low. Yet when you reach the 80s, next, and next, when you, when you get into the 80s, the incidence rate increase becomes rather marked uh, over, uh, over doubling. Um, next. And what you see on the right-hand side is where the peak prevalence of dementia is in people in their 80s. Most people with dementia are over the age, um, are over the age of 80. So the time for prevention is in the 60s and 70s and before, and the time for care is in the 80s and, uh, and later. But this is also what we mean by, by age substantially determining both phenotype and course of illness. Next. So one contribution uh, that the Lancet Commission made that we made is to better define life course risk factors, modifiable risk factors for, uh, for dementia. And they are di displayed in, that, uh, in the graphic on the left-hand side. Next. The modifiable risk factors, though, as I mentioned, are age, are life course dependent, are age related. For example, education is a substantial uh, or lack of education is a substantial risk, but it is lack of education before age 18 that, um, that comprises that risk. While midlife risk, uh, risks for Alzheimer's, for dementia, include hypertension, obesity, and hearing loss, and in late life, smoking, depression, physical inactivity, social isolation, and um, and diabetes. When you add this up, next, and look at the uh, population uh, attributable uh, risk, uh, the population uh, attributable risk factors, uh, next, and you add up this fraction of, uh, of risk, this comes to about 35% of all dementia, that in principle, 35% uh, of dementia can be reduced or eliminated by modifying these, um, uh, these risk factors and doing them at the right time, the right course. Next. And modifiable, there's also modifiable risk uh, from in the course of going from mild cognitive impairment to mild Alzheimer's disease. Diabetes, neuropsychiatric symptoms, and diet all uh, contribute to the risk of progression to, uh, to mild ED. This represents about 20% of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of the modifiable risk, uh, risk fraction. Uh, these risk factors can be mitigated through exercise, nutrition, cog uh, cognitive uh, psychotherapy, and psychotherapy, as well as potentially 
uh, uh, medications. And obviously, to be able to prolong or decrease the conversion from uh, MCI to, uh, to mild AD uh, substantially reduces burden of disease. Next. And so I'm just identifying the, uh, the proportion, uh, um, uh, the population uh, attributable uh, fraction. Next. So the, the, for the next couple of minutes before, before I end, I wanted to, to mention the burdens of care and dementia because as the Commission found and discussed in detail, that, that we can do substantially better at, uh, at reducing uh, burden on treatment providers, caregivers, families, uh, the burdens of treatment, and in protecting people with dementia. Next. The burdens, uh, uh, if you think about it, for treatment providers are uh, actually considerable and consist of um, uh, consists of the many treatment advisors, the diagnostic procedures we use, and uh, the, the need for, for environmental, uh, uh, psychological, and social uh, management. Also, treatment needs to be disease and stage specific. Next. And then the burdens on caregivers, uh, what, what the Commission found and wants to emphasize is really important, and that is uh, it's well known how much burden there is on caregivers. However, there are effective interventions that reduce risk and treat symptoms in both caregivers and, uh, and, uh, and, and people with dementia uh, that reduce uh, burdens. Such examples are start and reach. What we want to emphasize, though, is merely providing information is not effective. Uh, next, at reducing burden, that is. It's not effective. Next. And there is a need to individualize care. A take-home point uh, from this, we say we need to individualize care, but one particular way is through case management. Case management works. We see this over and over again. There are approaches to, to uh, to case uh, management that involve assessing both individual needs of the, uh, uh, of the family and of the patient and in service, uh, service planning. The management of, of disruptive and neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, turns out to be essential both for, for case management and for treatment. Next. And then I think, as many of you know, there's a need to protect people with dementia. The 25 percent of, uh, of older people are, uh, are abused. We can predict abuse to a good degree, and uh, we, can, uh, we can intervene if, 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 we, if we have the wherewithal and the desire to, uh, uh, to do that. Self-neglect is, uh, is a form of uh, uh, abuse and allowing uh, uh, people to become more vulnerable is as well. Next. So uh, in conclusion, um, there, there's the, uh, the seeming paradox of increased longevity, decreasing age-specific incidence as, uh, as the onset of, uh, of, of dementia occurs later and later in life, yet because of the increased longevity, increasing numbers of people with dementia. We can engage in ambitious prevention, intervention, and care. We can do that by mitigating risk factors at the appropriate time, and for MCI, by focusing on diet, diabetes, and behavioral symptoms, and intervening with psychotherapy as, as needed. And uh, intervention in people who have dementia involves reducing burden, treating symptoms, and individualizing care. So we have this capacity uh, to, to implement prevention and improve care now, and we really should be doing that. So thank you for, um, for, for listening, and I believe we have just a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Schneider. I will say, if you are having trouble, uh, out to participants, if you're having trouble uh, seeing the slides, that Google Chrome is the best browser to use. Uh, just very quickly, uh, where the Alzheimer's Association is funding an exciting uh, new study called U.S. Pointer. It's a two-year clinical trial 
to evaluate whether lifestyle interventions uh, that entail targeting multiple risk factors uh, actually do protect cognitive function in older adults. And then uh, the slide with the map shows it's part of a set of uh, similar uh, clinical trials, and there, we also provide the URL to access it. All right. Um, well, I think we could have gone on with Dr. Schneider for quite a bit more, but we did want to share, and know so many of you joined, and to hear what public health can do. And I uh, just wanted to provide a little background about these uh, two states that we're so pleased to feature, New Mexico and South Carolina. In 2016, uh, received some support here from the Alzheimer's Association from our CDC cooperative agreement. We awarded seven states uh, small grants to implement the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap. And, um, we are delighted to uh, be able to let you learn about the wonderful work that's been going on in South Carolina. Ms. Kulkowski, will you tell us about that? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, the next. To, to start off with, I want to tell you a little bit about why we chose the approach that we did. South Carolina has one of the larger senior populations in the South Carolina with 17% of our residents age 65 or older. We also have a rapidly growing population of Alzheimer's dementia just from this year to 2025. It's expected to grow about 35%. We also have about a quarter of our state's residents who are African American and are at a greater risk, almost twice as likely, to develop Alzheimer's disease. And of course, South Carolina is situated in the middle of the stroke belt with higher rates of stroke and cardiovascular disease. So with all of those components in mind, this project we approached with the goals of educating diverse audiences about dementia and risk factors that impact brain health to disseminate those messages about brain health to help people make decisions that may reduce their risk for cognitive decline, and then to integrate early detection and diagnosis as well as risk reduction messages into existing public health messages and programs. Next. So this worked out really well because the, the campaign elements that we focused on really aligned directly with existing public health messages. So we put together a multi-layered campaign that included a new part of the DHEC website, um, public health education materials, social media messages, radio public service announcements, as well as an online pledge that encouraged residents to commit to taking certain actions. So the slide you see is just a slice of the brochure that we put together, but you can see we're talking about exercise and nutrition. We're talking about um, looking at the numbers that influence your heart health and keeping them in check, as well as smoking cessation. And so all of these messages were designed to mobilize South Carolinians to protect their brain health and reduce their risk of cognitive impairment by being more active and eating better, quitting smoking, controlling hypertension and diabetes, and so on. So one of the things that was really exciting to see is that new section of the DHEC website. This particular screen shows um, a big banner on the home page when we first launched it, which was up for a couple of months with um, high visibility there next. Uh, but it lived on in a subpage, which we're still utilizing today, that has a lot of information about cognitive impairment and dementia, as well as risk factors. And so creating this website also gave us an opportunity to host a pledge next, uh, which was an exciting way to engage people that we're talking with and sort of sweeten the pot, if you will. So we came up with the Healthy Body, Healthy Brain Pledge which actually encouraged people to enter the drawing, and they did that through an online form uh, in which they pledged to engage in seven behaviors that would promote their brain health, such as exercising, avoiding tobacco use, keeping their blood pressure under control, uh, wearing a helmet or a seat belt, and those sorts of activities. So we did a monthly drawing for four months, and we collected over 200 pledges, so that was a, a, a nice way to get people talking. Next. 
And one of the other cornerstones of this campaign ended up being our radio PSAs, which focused similarly on those risk factors for cognitive decline. Uh, this was uh, a great campaign because we worked with different radio stations in the area, which helped us reach diverse demographic backgrounds. So we had rural and urban. We had different income levels, educational attainment, and ages represented, and the listenership for those radio stations. The PSA pointed towards the public health, uh, the brain health webpage, and the smoking quit line, and essentially were conversational in nature, talking about, oh, are you doing that to lose weight? No, I'm doing this because it's good for my brain. Um, and so we were able to air 1,500 PSAs on those four stations beginning during Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month in June 2017. They continued for seven weeks. And one of the cool things about this was that each station chose their own speaker to record the PSA, which resulted in greater cultural appropriateness for its particular audience. So through those PSAs, we were able to reach over 2.7 million people. Next. So the takeaways were, gosh, we kind of used a whole lot more money and a lot more resources to keep this up. Um, so the good news is, with the modest resources that we had, we were able to develop a lot of materials that we can still use today. Uh, we realized we were very ambitious at first, and we wanted to do a similar Spanish language campaign, but we realized that that to really be um, culturally appropriate, it needed more than just a direct translation and that we needed greater resources to really work on that aspect of what the message would be. But we did end up having some great new partnerships. We worked with Eat Smart Move More in South Carolina, which is exactly how it sounds. Um, it tries to give people opportunities to get out into um, local spaces like parks and connect them um, with healthy food opportunities like farmers markets and those sorts of things. We also partnered with our local heart association um, as well as um, historically black university who helped get our message out to their membership, as well as the uh, Prevention Research Center at the University of South Carolina, which has a brain health um, effort underway as well. One other really cool thing that developed from this is we utilized our data that we already had from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. We looked at the cognitive module data that we collected in 2015 and did a little analysis to see how the answers differed among people who smoked versus were non-smokers and among people with pre-diabetes or diabetes. And we did see those elevated levels of subjective cognitive decline. So in other words, people who said, yes, I am having memory concerns that are impacting my daily life. Um, so that helped validate the, the messages that we're getting out there and helped us understand that those are populations that we need to focus on in the future. And then, of course, this whole thing worked really well for us despite those modest resources because we're focusing on public health messages where they naturally align. So all of these messages that we talked about today are already going out through various aspects of what the agency is already doing. So even though we um, can't keep a full bore brain health campaign going all year round without more resources, we now um, have some things to put into place and look creatively at low cost uh, ways that we can continue to use it. And that's about it. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilkowski. And I you know, really like how this effort was designed for to be sustainable, showed a lot of public health ingenuity um, and certainly use of data and some uh, and of course leveraging partnerships those are a lot of public health strengths uh, for those who have inquired yes we will send out the slides and the webinar recording uh, next week oh, and now I'm delighted to turn to New Mexico um, and they're going to be focusing on how they uh, were integrating brain health into the department's overall healthy aging efforts. Uh, Ms. Wexler? I'm here, Molly. We're ready. Okay. Um, thanks. And uh, it's so exciting to see what other um, states did with um, this, this opportunity and to um, 
to see that uh, public health ingenuity and how it aligns with what we did too. That I think that's really cool. So um, uh, just a broad overview of New Mexico. You know, we're one of, I think, uh, 10 states that actually has a centralized health department. So that means we have uh, we have no county health departments in essence, and uh, we're stretched pretty thin in terms of providing resources in our very large straight state, which is the fifth largest state in the nation and is primarily rural and uh, frontier populations. So uh, we have a lot of challenges just in terms of resources. And also, uh, we are expected see about a 36% increase in uh, Alzheimer's and dementia diagnoses in the, ne in the next seven years. And we have the fourth highest growth rate in terms of these diseases in New Mexico. So we're facing a big challenge uh, moving forward. Gary, did you want to say anything here? I did. Uh, as you were saying, uh, New Mexico is the sixth least densely populated state in the US. And it provides its challenges for us to be able to provide services throughout the state. Uh, the New Mexico chapter is a statewide chapter with offices in Santa Fe, Farmington, Roswell, Las Cruces, and Albuquerque. And in our services, we, are, we focus on uh, taking care of people with Alzheimer's and dementia, but also on caregivers, because we know that caregivers in rural and frontier states really carry a large burden uh, for keeping people in their home community where there aren't a lot of research, uh, resources. And just to give you a sense, uh, with the help of volunteers, we uh, last year delivered um, had a thousand people attend our savvy caregiver education course, which is an evidence-based program, and are in our process of increase, increasing the number of volunteers that we will use with that. And so as you'll hear through this whole thing, it's important to build partnerships so that we all extend our reach as the Department of Health, the New Mexico Aging and Long-Term Services Department. Next. Okay, so I think actually, can we just back up to that previous slide? Um, uh, and I just want to talk briefly about our goals. We wanted to, uh, many of our goals for you public health people out there were aligned with actually the uh, FAB accreditation, domain three and domain one. Domain three is education and domain one is assess. And so um, we wanted to increase awareness of cognitive health and impairment among health professionals and the public. We wanted to monitor the prevalence of uh, subjective cognitive decline in New Mexico residents, as well as the extent of caregiving for people with dementia or other cognitive impairment disorders. And we wanted to uh, help educate caregivers about chronic disease self-management, um, the Stanford evidence-based program, because it dovetails nicely with the Savvy Caregiver program. And uh, our approach was we, we utilized existing material um, we utilized Alzheimer's Association materials, and as uh, as was shown in South Carolina, those are uh, already many of those messages. The ten ways to love your brain messages are already widely disseminated and accepted public health messages. So the um, the approaches align and dovetail nicely with each other, and we adopt we adapted existing materials because we don't have a, a large marketing department at NMDOH so we use Alzheimer's Association materials which are so beautifully done and we attempted to implement some sustainable actions with long-term impact and if I could add with that we have considered implementing sustainable actions as being as building partnerships with the New Mexico Department of Health, with the Aging and Long-Term Services Department for the state, uh, because in a, in a state like New Mexico that's rural and frontier, relationships really are key to us being able to coordinate our messages, coordinate services, and extend our reach. Uh, because the issues of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in the U.S. create serious public health issues. And our partnerships advance the conversation in the state via our training, our PSA, and DOH messaging. And it creates synergy as we start to push this out to all of the communities in the state. Next. OK. so. As I already mentioned, some specific actions that we took was uh, we provided chronic, the Stanford 
chronic disease self-management program and uh, national diabetes prevention program classes to caregivers or to folks who had already, who were uh, educated in the Savvy Caregiver program. Um, and we, we focused on reaching uh, Native American and Hispanic caregivers. Um, we did attempt, um, we had more success reaching out to people in the more rural areas of the state, perhaps because there aren't as many opportunities to participate in programs in those areas of the state. Uh, and so people were happy to jump into this highly supported version of, um, of these programs where they had, where respite, respite care was provided uh, by the Alzheimer's Association as part of the program. And um, we also made several efforts to uh, educate the public and, and caregivers, but also our public health workforce about the reality that uh, healthy, that dementia and Alzheimer's is a public health issue. And uh, so some of the ways that we did that, we, you know, we present, we were at the Public Health Association conference last year in a couple of ways, and, and we um, developed this media campaign, which we're going to share with you in a moment. And uh, internally, uh, I'm still working with my uh, public health peers to try and uh, get people to to accept this reality that this is a public health issue. And before we go to the next slide, if I could add, uh, Rachel and I have been having conversations along with Aging and Long-Term Services as how, what do we do to move forward even though this grant is ending, we want to move forward and continue to have this partnership and kind of expanding our thinking to think that maybe volunteers can help us to uh, deliver some of the programs that we've defined. One of the other things that we have done in New Mexico is that we have um, worked very hard with the Department of Health uh, to get the behavioral risk factor surveillance survey modules for cognitive decline in, care, in the caregiver survey done. We did cognitive decline in 2016 and the caregiver survey in 2017. Um, we contributed with the help of the Home Office $72,000 to that. It's a priority for us, though, because data about New Mexico is essential for us to have a clear understanding of the scope of the needs of our population so that we can develop strategies to implement uh, change and programs that are going to make a difference. And I will tell folks, I think we're going to show you the video here, if you have uh, computer speakers, if you'll turn up the volume on those so that you'll be able to hear this. Hey, Gary, if you might mute your phone, uh, I think we're getting some feedback. We're going to start the video over. Uh, Gary, if you can mute your phone just so we don't hear it through the computer and the phone at the same time, that'd be great. Hold on, we'll restart the video for everyone. Every time I see it, I just feel so happy. I think it's so awesome. And um, we did have some success getting that commercial played on uh, two local affiliates here in Albuquerque, the um, NBC affiliate and the CBS affiliate. And we're still going to work to try and get that out uh, more broadly because we think it's a fantastic product. Gary? Next. <laughs> we're on. 
partnerships, right? Yes, um, partnership. So we have effectively uh, worked collaboratively collaboratively with the Department of Health and with the New Mexico Aging and Long-Term Services Department to roll out our state plan for dementia and to start to make strategies in New Mexico that are going to change the kinds of services and the kinds of access that people with Alzheimer's and dementia have as well as caregivers. And that's been very important to us as we think about how do we create synergy to be able to extend our reach. And I will tell you, with the help of the Aging and Long-Term Services Department, they fund a lot of the core uh, care and support programs that the department, that, that the association delivers, and they really are a key partner in helping to roll out that state plan. And I will say that we now have the University of New Mexico Memory and Aging Center, and it's the only center devoted to Alzheimer's and dementia research and treatment in New Mexico or the Mountain West region. And with that, we have included them in the partnership in terms of increasing access to care, increasing the ability for folks to get a reliable diagnosis, and in the future, looking at ways that we can um, increase the amount of uh, physician education about uh, creating comfort, about making a diagnosis for Alzheimer's and dementia. So we have been, we're very grateful for these partnerships. Next. Okay, so um, some of the outcomes, uh, just like South Carolina, we have those materials now housed on our NMDOH website, the 10 Ways to Love Your Brain materials and other um, brain health resources. That did not exist before. That's a new thing for us. So that's, a, that's fantastic. And... Um, we funded these courses, and we're going to continue to, as Gary mentioned, to, to uh, move this forward, this partnership forward, in the hopes that we can um, uh, recruit volunteers who might participate in both the CD, the self chronic disease self management program, and uh, leading savvy caregivers. That's that's our new our new plan, uh, and um, as it says there, people participate in both programs. And I just want to mention, it's not here, but um, uh, the, uh, the PSA, we're hoping actually, if anybody on the line is interested in picking that up and running it locally, that, that was part of our intent, that it be available to anybody who wants to use it. And I heard a rumor that um, Houston is going to pick it up and, um, and actually produce a Spanish language version of it as well, which would be a, a huge, that would be a huge victory as far as we're concerned. So, um, if you do want to uh, have access to that, Molly. Molly can help you with that piece. And go ahead, Gary. And uh, one of the other outcomes of this is that we uh, presented at last year's New Mexico Public Health Association conference. Uh, on uh, dementia in New Mexico with the Department of Health, UNM, Aging and Long-Term Services Department, and what it has done is helped us to clarify what our uh, vision and values are about intervening in Alzheimer's, dementia, and taking care of caregivers as we're having conversations about public health. And that really has kind of been one of the biggest outcomes for us is changing the conversation about using public health strategies to be able to deal with Alzheimer's and dementia issues. Rachel? Next, next slide. I know we're, we're like basically out of time, but um, I just, you know, these are the things that we learned. And I have to mention Barbara Howe, who was really the person who um, had some of these brain, these quick insights about how we could make the best use of this money. And one of the things that she did is she just called, cold called um, video production companies, and she found a company who was willing to do this work because they recognized the importance of it. Or they did it for very little money. So that, you know, that's the thing about ask for help and, like, follow your intuition. And also the willingness to collaborate with whoever wants to come to the table is, of course, always huge, 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 huge in public health. And then the thing about combining existing programming that we're already utilizing, like the uh, MyCD, and combining it with the Savvy Caregiver, that's, I guess, a, a fairly um, a unusual practice. But it seems once you once you say it, it seems rather obvious. And so those would be our recommendations to make use of existing resources and programs. 
Uh, we're going to, just in the interest of time, uh, encourage you to visit our Alzheimer's Public Health Resource Center online. You can get data and you can get some of the resources we talked about. Next week, I will send uh, information about how to access the New Mexico PSAs. Uh, South Carolina's made their scripts for their radio PSAs available. Those can be uh, our Alzheimer's Association chapters are a great resource. And I did want to, um, because Dr. Schneider had mentioned and talked about hypertension, uh, there is an NIH campaign that can be co-branded called My Dear Risk. That is uh, certainly well done. So to recap, uh, the Lancet Commission, the Alzheimer's Association, other groups have found that there is a growing evidence base to support population level efforts to reduce risk for cognitive decline, possibly dementia. Um, as certainly exemplified by New Mexico and South Carolina, public health has a very important role. Um, this is such a big area. Uh, how do I prevent Alzheimer's or dementia? That's such a big uh, area that the public is very hungry to learn about. Um, and they have done it uh, through both campaigns focused on brain health and integrating uh, brain health, cognitive health uh, information and, uh, and concerns into existing public health programming. So again, thank you so much for participating in our webinar for National Public Health Week. I want to thank my outstanding speakers. Next week we will be sending more information to you. And operator, uh, please go ahead and close the conference line.